Bergen uh, from Missions Publique, who will also share the initiatives that they have been uh, undertaking. So welcome again to the session. And with that, I, I will um, um, give the floor to Antoine, who will give us some context of the Global Digital Compact. So Antoine, you have the floor. Yes, hello, thank you, um, and hello, everyone. Uh, first of all, um, I am part of the digital crowd today uh, in the room. So uh, thank you and uh, welcome to all the participants that are online. Uh, I will be also looking at, at the chat. Um, so we are here today to talk about the engagement of citizens and stakeholders into the digital uh, global compact. Uh, what it is about, maybe a word, and you were saying um, that uh, Yu Ping is going to, to explain a bit. She is in a, another meeting, so she will join a bit later. So I will um, start um, explaining the context uh, in, on behalf of, of her, and then she will join to share some experience um, they have done at the UN Tech Envoy Office. And, Antoine, and sorry that, to interrupt the, you. Sorry to interrupt you, but Yu Ping is already here. So if, if you ah, okay. So Yu Ping, you can you, so you can start. <laughs> so I would like to give the floor to Yu Ping from the UN Tech Envoy Office. Uh, and if you want to, to guide us um, on the four slides you have on the process <laughs> and the first uh, learnings you have, that would be great. Thank you. With apologies, Antoine, I have the opposite problem where today I'm a little bit early to a meeting and versus a little bit late. So, um, no, no, no problem. And actually, I just want to start by saying how much we welcome this opportunity to hear views from stakeholders into the Global Digital Compact. Many of you might have heard already a lot of references and the family at the Office of the Tech Envoy in the United Nations really want this to be inclusive and transparent. And that's why a lot of the thinking around the Global Digital Compact at this part of the process so far is to hear from different groups, different stakeholders, try and listen as much as possible and engage as much as possible. So what I will do is update you a little bit on the process and maybe we can go to the first slide. Yes, sure. Thank you. And then we could also maybe take questions later if there are any questions about it. Post the slides on the screen. Thank you. Thank you. So where we are right now is that the negotiations on the Global Digital Compact will be a member state-led process. So the President of the General Assembly in the United Nations in New York has appointed facilitators to lead a process where the member states discuss the Global Digital Compact. But there is an important aspect of multi-stakeholder contributions and engagement. And here, we are really hoping that besides sort of having inclusive consultations and dialogues, there will also be a strong push by stakeholders and member states to really say that as part of the member state-led process, there will be more than enough ample opportunity for stakeholders to also be part of the process itself. So not just in consultations and dialogues, but also when the negotiations themselves start, whether there can be some input processes for stakeholders as well. So this is where we at the Office of the Tech Envoy have already created this sort of infrastructure around having inclusive consultations and dialogues. And that's where, for instance, on the website of the Office of the Tech Envoy, we have launched a public call for inputs to hear from anyone, anywhere as to what you think should be part of the Global Digital Compact. So if you go to our office website, there's a specific section where you can submit your inputs and those inputs will be then displayed publicly for everyone else to see and to interact with. And we hope that that will be the opportunity to really hear from everyone, every member of the public, every organization that's interested, networks, constituencies, as to what you want to tell the UN and the member states and the negotiators for the compact, what should be the content of this compact itself. So that's the public inputs that we are hoping can be as diverse and representative as possible. And then we as the Secretariat will compile this together and present it to the member states, hopefully to actually give them the ammunition to say that this is what the global community wants to see. And in the process of negotiation of the compact itself, also make sure to feed in these diverse voices as well. And then the Global Digital Compact will be adopted at the Summit of the Future, which will take place in September of 2024. So this has been announced by the Secretary General of the UN as part of a major report that he issued one year ago called Our Common Agenda, where he has called for a summit of the future, which is not just about digital, but other areas as well, such as youth participation, um, outer space, environment, emergency preparedness, peace, a new agenda for peace, with digital being one of the key aspects of the summit of the future. So that's the Global Digital Compact. Could we have the next slide, please? So a little too fast. 
Yes, September 2024. So if you look at this outline of the slides and timeline, this is basically some background of where we are and where we hope to be in September 2024. It all started with the report that I mentioned, the Secretary General's Common Agenda Report that was issued in September 23. And then what we did as the office is to launch the online consultation platform, the call for inputs I just mentioned earlier of this year. And then there were also these consultations that were organized in New York among the member states and stakeholders, initially around the Common Agenda report. And now we are in the phase where we're going to have consultations for the Global Digital Compact itself with the collection of all these various inputs from stakeholders. And the facilitators for this process have actually already been appointed by the President of the General Assembly. It will be the permanent representatives of Sweden and Rwanda in New York. So the ambassadors that lead the delegations there in New York, and they will also be using all the inputs that we help as an office help gather the system-wide sort of um, initiation of activities that the rest of the UN system are embarking on to prepare for the Global Digital Compact as well. So some of you might have been in the open forum that just took place where the UN agencies were all talking about what they're doing vis-a-vis -vis the Global Digital Compact, events that they're organizing, activities that they see as contributing to the thinking around the Global Digital Compact, and how they see the Global Digital Compact as impacting the work in the long run. So we're right now in that sort of consultation phase which will then lead to, I know, it's a lot of UN processes, so bear with me as I go through them. The next sort of big milestone will be in September of 2023. So not September 24 for the Summit of the Future itself, but next September, there will be a ministerial meeting on the whole Summit of the Future. Um, and then there will then be the Summit of the Future itself in September of 24. And in between sort of this timeline, you'll see it on the slide itself, the Secretary General of the United Nations and our office will be producing these issue briefs, updates on the process with some of the thinking where we will be collecting a lot of these public inputs, results of consultations like this, um, views that we solicited and we've heard from stakeholders as part of that preparatory material to be compiled and presented to member states as part of the negotiation towards the Global Digital Compact. Can I have the next slide? Oh, that's such a oh do we? If, if I may, I moved it because ah. I was thinking you would, you would come later. So you have to skip five or six slides and then comes yours. Okay. So and then okay. we will see yours. Yes. Um, to, yeah, here. Right. Perfect. Thank you, Antoine. So these are the areas where the Secretary General in his original report, Our Common Agenda, proposed as suggestions for inclusion in the Global Digital Compact. So if you go to the Tech Envoy website, you'll see that the initial areas that we suggested to get views and inputs on are these seven that are listed here. So connect all people to the internet, avoiding internet fragmentation, human rights online, protecting data. And this is where the inspiration for the IGF comes from, right? The five priority areas, the tracks for this year's IGF accord with these seven areas. And so that's also why we're seeing the IGF consultations and discussions here as very important as feeding into the Global Digital Compact because it's precisely these types of discussions we're having here that will be the basis of these inputs and the consideration for the Global Digital Compact. So this alignment that we've had with the IGF this year has been really very valuable. And we're really looking to all of you to provide the concrete meat of these recommendations from the IGF into the UN. So these are the seven areas that have already been proposed as part of the Global Digital Compact. But in some of the discussions that we've had so far, some of the consultations that we've held, there have been suggestions for other areas. Can we go to the next slide? And so some of these are these other issues that seem to have come up already. And so there are opportunities through our website to talk about other areas. So not just the seven, but also to suggest some of these other areas. But we also welcome further thinking around other areas as well that you can you know, approach my office to continue a consultation on or provide more substantive inputs on. So these are some areas that have come up that there is a sense where we also need to focus on the opportunity side of digital technologies. And I think you heard the Tech Envoy actually really emphasize this point that besides addressing the challenges and risk of digital technology, which is very true, we also need to realize what the transformation Transformative potential of digital technologies are, and to really look at how digital tech can be part of achieving the sustainable development goals. So, in terms of some of these areas, for instance, the nexus between digital and environment, um, the issue of digital public infrastructure, digital economy, and so on, that's a lot of the issues that are coming up, including at discussions here. So these are additional areas that you know have come up, and we encourage others to consider as well. So for instance, um, there's been a push for gender to be at the heart of the Global Digital Compact, and that is something that should be addressed. So I think I'll stop there so as to give enough time for other comments and reflections, but happy to take any further questions.
I think, thank you so much, Yuping, and I think it, uh, it could be important to take the opportunity that you are here to just hear if there are questions in relation to the process and the timeline, starting perhaps by sharing the deadline for contributions. Ah. Uh, it could be important to hear about that, and then please let me know if you have any question for Yuping. So the public call for inputs, the deadline for submission to my office through the website is March of 30. 31st of March next year. So there's still quite a little bit of time. I mean, I will be very frank and say that is the official deadline that's on the website. So we really encourage people to try and get it in by then. I think, though, that there will be opportunities also to reflect on further inputs a little bit later on. But please try and get it in by 31st of March because we want to use that as the means to consolidate a report from our office to the member states. And then time for others to look at your inputs and also think about how to engage collectively. This is why I actually think that the most impact will come from coalitions of like-minded constituencies, networks, NGOs, coalescing around certain themes. And so if you put your input on the website, you can see who are the other like-minded partners that could come together in these types of constituencies around key areas of interest. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Is there any question? for you being in relation to what you have heard. Please go ahead. Um, quite clear, but always fast. Uh, <laughs> what he said, um, putting your suggestions or one suggestions on the website will give opportunities to see where you can build coalitions. I think that some of us who work in this space we already see the potential for pulling together coalitions. In which case, pulling together a coalition and actually getting back from um, focus group discussions and other kinds of stakeholder engagement, probably we are not going to be there fully by March. And so um, I think that there's individual organizational feedback and then there should be coalition type feedback. And um, just because we are in the room, I'm, I'm just thinking because I represent the council. And usually whenever we're talking about these things, uh, we focus a lot on civil society. When it comes to digital, we now have to focus a lot more on the private sector. But I wanted to suggest that we could give some guidelines as to how to do the stakeholder engagements in such a way that they're really multi-stakeholder. Because if we talk among ourselves, most of us are already persuaded of what needs to happen. But it's only by listening to others that we can figure how we're going to make it happen because we understand better the other points of view. So I just wanted to say that we had just coming out of the session, um, which was looking at, uh, how can we put it, um, forced, let's say, online. Let's, simp let's simplify that. And this is a major issue and a very tricky issue. It goes to the heart of different value systems that exist globally. So I just wanted to mention that because it's not there. And children's rights and child abuse is, I think, one that all of us are concerned about, not only for the traditional kinds of pornographic elements, but also now with the involvement of major digital platforms in education, we are looking at children's data rights and their rights to privacy as well. Thank you. I think it's a very important issue. I really hope that you can raise this via the platform about creating those constituencies. One other idea I have on this idea that you're saying that it's very important to have also feedback on these. I think also you should look to which agency you want to make sure that these issues have a life beyond the GDC. So the GDC is a document, but what we also want to do is give the guidance and motivation and sort of turbocharge parts of the UN that are already working in this space. So for instance, child online protection, there is um, the Global Partnership to End Violence Against Children, which is very active and actually has been talking to my office and myself about how they can actually precisely amplify this issue 
of child rights and child protection online. So in the same way, I really do encourage colleagues, if you're interested in particular areas, come reach out and I'll try and connect you with the parts of the UN or other like-minded partners who might want to make sure that precisely you have that feedback and coalitions and try and initiate types of activities that can go beyond just the GDC but also persist in concrete ways beyond just the compact itself. Thank you very much both. Any other question before we move forward? Go ahead, please. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Frank Ategeka and I'm from Uganda. I have specific questions around um, leadership involvement. Um, if I heard you right, you mentioned that um, the inputs are supposed to come from the various countries, right? So the platform is actually open to everyone anywhere. So private individuals actually have been writing in to the platform. So you as an individual can submit. We allow for governments to submit. We allow for NGOs, organizations. And so it can be really literally any organization, any person. It doesn't just have to be governments. And so that's the whole point of it, being multi-stakeholder, that it's open to everyone. OK, so now that's where my comment is. Most of these. Um, for example, the global con uh, compact in my country back home in Uganda, the people that would be implementing this would be uh, the country leadership. We have the ministries, uh, the Minister of ICT. We have the uh, regulators for the telecommunication companies, Uganda Communication Commission. And uh, I'm not sure the extent to which these stakeholders are aware, because even when come to discuss all these issues. Personally, of course, I'll go back and put my comments, and I'll also be able to reach out to a few other stakeholders, and they'll give their uh, inputs. At the end of the day, when it comes back to the countries, because you're supposed to carry these forward in terms of policy implementation, the people that are going to be implementing this may not specifically be aware, and it might be a challenge. So for me, um, I think it links back to what she mentioned, the level of stakeholder um, engagement. For me, the suggestion would be maybe we have a country level specific involvement where we have the top leadership. For example, representatives from the Minister of um, ICT in my own country, the regulators, the telecom companies, because these are key stakeholders, and civil society organizations like us working on digital rights. And then you have a collective effort, and then those um, discussions that feed into that online template could actually come from a focus group discussion of all those stakeholders. Because what I foresee at the end of the day, we are going to have uh, silos or individual people giving their opinions. But at the end of the day, it is the people that have no power that are going to give um, their opinion. And those that have power and mandated to implement these policies will not be able to take part. So I don't know if you have a solution around that. Thank you. I will just take two more questions. You can respond. And then we will move uh, forward with the presentations of the experiences of consultations and um, development of uh, submissions so far. And then we can go back to questions. So Maggie, if you want to go ahead, and then I will give the floor to someone who is participating online. Yes, thank you very much. And thank you, Yuping, for running through the uh, the context and the, um, the timeline for the process of engagement with stakeholders. Uh, my name is Mark Carvel. I'm, I'm a member of EURIDIC, the European Regional IGF, and uh, I'm leading for the for EURIDIC running an online consultation, which we've got. We've got a commenting platform ready uh, and, and actually open to start uh, receiving contributions from stakeholders across the European region. And uh, so we plan to submit a response, a contribution uh, in, in, uh, in line with your uh, uh, consultation process uh, early next year. Um, my question really is about the process beyond the report I mentioned was, is going to be a compilation uh, and the ministerial meeting in September next year and beyond that leading up to and including the summit of the future. Will there be further opportunities for stakeholder communities including our regional IGF, to, to engage in the process uh, while the member states are negotiating and hopefully doing so in an open and transparent way. So that's my question. What will happen uh, beyond uh, 
no. the summer. Thank you. Thank you. You've been, and perhaps just a question from a remote participant, uh, Sergei Romanov, who is asking about uh, the legal force of the Global Digital Compact. Is the Digital Compact supposed to be any legally binding document? And then um, we will go back to the other questions uh, at the end of the session. Thank you. Very quickly, let me start from the back. No, it's not meant to be a legally binding document. But I think that links to what the first colleague had mentioned, right? At the end of the day, it is still a document that is to be signed by the heads of states of all countries. So in the same way that, you know, we look to normative guidance or these soft law instruments from the UN, you take this document and say your head of state committed to these specific commitments and actions. And we expect you, ICT regulators, ministries, government officials to abide by these principles that ha your head of state have already committed to. So this is why I also make an appeal to stakeholders. The more concrete these suggestions can be, the more you build these suggestions and press the member states to put in that kind of specific language, the more we can hold people to these specific asks from civil society and the international community on what we expect to be in the Global Digital Compact. Um, and then so to that second to the second question from Mark about um, opportunities for engagement, to be very frank, it is ultimately a member state led process because it occurs in the UN, which is primarily a member state institution. And so in some ways, it's not for the UN secretary to decide the process itself has appointed these co-facilitators, which I mentioned, the Swedish and the Rwandese PR, it is that it's for them technically as representatives of the member states to decide on the formal process of negotiation um, and how stakeholders will be involved. We are certainly doing what we can to make sure that stakeholder inputs are already factored in and to clearly communicate to them that there is strong commitment, enthusiasm from the stakeholder community to be part of that process and that there is huge value in making sure that communities are consulted because you all, these are representatives of the ministries of foreign affairs, precisely not the representatives and the technical experts and so forth. So it's really important that the discussions in New York be informed by those who are working in the field directly with policies, affected by policies, marginalized communities and so forth. But then what we do need is for everyone to really activate that sort of constituency that you have with member states as well to make sure that that is fed into the member state-led process. That the member states that really do value the, val the IGF and multi-stakeholder inputs also say this when it comes to negotiations Secretariat that's at the highest level, the Secretary General has said that he expects the Global Digital Compact to be the outcome of a multi-stakeholder digital track. But what we need to do is make sure that that message is also clearly communicated through in New York as well. Thank you so much, Yupin and everyone for the questions and the interest. So let's now hear uh, from UNENA in relation to the initiatives that the uh, Web Foundation have been undertaking. So NENA, over to you. Host, if you can unmute. Uh, hello, everyone. Can you still hear me? Yes, go ahead. Uh, okay, so I am live from the stadium. Uh, this is the Yopato Senegal match. I'll be going off camera. I don't want you to concentrate on the match instead of Nena? concentrating can on the global system. Nena? Nena, sorry to interrupt you, but we uh, are really having problems hearing you. If you can't go to a quiet place or get closer to your mic, we will really appreciate that. Uh, can I be heard now? No, really struggling. So uh, while while you sort that out... I want uh, to make sure I'm being yeah, heard. That's better. So Nena is uh, trying to engage 60,000 people um, on the Digital Global Compact during a, a football match in Qatar. And we will see what the results are of that engagement in a couple of hours. Okay, so okay, let's, let's while Nena enough. sort that out, let me... You know, I think she's so are you back, Nena? Yes, I am. Okay, go ahead, please. Great. So, um, following up from you, Ping, I wanted to share two, three things. Uh, we, we have the context. Uh, this session is supposed to be for one hour, so we should be mindful of the time. The first thing I wanted to ask to look at is how do we maintain civic engagement? From the Web Foundation side, we have had 
five consultations, in-person consultations across media, across activists, across uh, the IGF, across women, across men who work in the Women's Rights Online Network. These are different communities. So my first recommendation, Antoine, from the, the consultations we've had, is on trust. Number one, for civic engagement, I think we need to think of community uh, coalitions. Uh, I think Dorothy talked about coalitions, and you've been mentioned it. Community-based coalitions. In other words, people who are from the same region can have a coalition and give an input and follow the process. The other one is thematic coalitions. Are you interested in human rights? Are you interested in connectivity? We can have coalitions around this and contribute and follow the process. So that's my first recommendation. My, first, my second recommendation is on the sustainability of it. I don't want to be the only one being at all, all web foundation. It is true that we host a coalition of about 100 organizations, but the foundation may not always be there next no, year, 2024, I don't know when. We may not always have a nana, we may not always have a web foundation. You see what I mean? So it is very important for us to maintain sustainability. And now I don't see it. My third and final point is engaging at the national level. Our friend from Uganda spoke about it. It is not enough to engage for the office of the tech boy, but it is important that we get on the ground with our member states because they are the ones who will negotiate this thing. Finally, as I said to member states that invited me around this time last week, we must ensure that the communication and transparency is key. Because when we know how the process is going, it is easier to accept the end product. Now be mindful that the end will not be satisfactory to you. And that is why you need to engage and make sure that others engage so that you get the minimum. Thank you very much. The match is about to start. I'm going to be going off, ca off camera or off mic. Thanks, and then I'll, I'll remain online in case there are questions. I may type them in, but feel free to mail me or on Twitter. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Nana. And it was indeed surprising to hear you with the background of the, of the, the uh, yes, the song of my country. <laughs> That's weird. Okay. Uh, now, uh, uh, let me go with uh, someone in the room. I would like to invite Jamila Venturini from Derechos Digitales, uh, one of the organizations who are part of the program committee of the LAC IGF, the regional IGF in Latin America and the Caribbean, uh, who align uh, uh, its process this year with, uh, with the Global Digital Compact. So we will hear from Jamila in relation to the process and also the concerns and the priorities that the regional community identified. So Jamila, welcome and please share you. Thank you, Valeria. Uh, yes, and my intervention goes a bit in line with um, what was said before on the need to converge debates and conversation about digital cooperation in relevant and consolidated multi-stakeholder processes and also um, reacting a bit to what Nina was saying, finding there a form of reaching sustainable engagement from, from the community. In the case of the LAC IGF, as Valeria was mentioning, uh, Derechos Digitales together with APC also are members of the program committee of the LAC IGF. And this year we saw a great value in using such space to advance a regional agenda and to engage the different stakeholders to join conversations around the Global Digital Compact. And it was also an opportunity to resignify this as a key regional coordination space. Um, the Latin American IGF uh, this year happened online, as in the previous uh, editions, and had more than 400 registrations and a peak of almost 80 simultaneous participants online during three days of event. 
The first day of the Lakai Jeff was dedicated to NRIs and youth sessions, and it had the significant uh, youth uh, participation calling for uh, cryptography as a fundamental mechanism for the digital world and the need for secure systems. Um, acknowledging the rapid rev evolution of computing power and the advance of quantum computers in a way that is more accessible to people and how uh, people can intervene in the way these uh, emerging technologies are built, the need to create secure software and web applications and accelerate adoption of uh, common standards, the need for security by design, um, and some of the f future challenges for the world of education and work. During the following two days, four sessions were organized in topics identified from the Global Digital Compact Agenda by the Latin American community through a public consultation facilitated by the Program Committee and highlighted the following regional priorities, which I will try to synthesize uh, as much as I can. Uh, in terms of con connectivity, there was a call for an, for an enabling environment that allowed the coexistence of different models of provision of connectivity and access, as well as special measures oriented to ensure a affordable access to internet and not cumbersome access to licenses and spectrum, redesigning the universal service funds with gender and diversity perspectives, the need for investments, the need for incentives for investments, tax reductions, etc. On the protection of human rights in digital environment, the diagnosis is that digitization of digitalization of public services has accelerated um, in the past years without considerations on human rights. At the same time, some of the challenges identified in the regions had to do with the advance of biometric or facial recognition technologies, uh, the tendency for governments to acquire uh, technologies for surveillance, intrusion, um, as well as attempt to limit and do encryption in the region. Another point highlighted was related to tech-facilitated gender-based violence, which have concrete impact on survivors', survivors lives, as participants highlighted and institutions, um, the need for institutions to uh, also take responsibility on handling sensitive data and on answering to these, these issues. Um, and while a lack of a single standard for the governance of artificial intelligence in other regulatory matters was highlighted as an issue, a strong statement was made that there are big challenges in adopting global frameworks and as they do not particularly when they do not adapt to local realities. This was also an issue highlighted in a second session about data protection, when again comments were made that some common regional standards are useful for the advance of data protection frameworks in Latin America, but they, that doesn't mean they have to be the same. And again, a call on contextualized regulation was also made in for a stronger connection among the development of standards and regulation and the living realities of people that are being affected by regulation and technology. Finally, um, there was a session dedicated to disinformation and platform regulation under which participants highlighted the need for the state and the private sector to adhere to accountability and human rights mechanisms and also uh, shared concerns around how public authorities um, discourse may potentialize violence and disinformed speech um, and also represents a misuse of the public infrastructure they are supposed to, to take care of. Um, so I will keep it here. There were some uh, mentions about the need to tackle gender disinformation, uh, emphasis on digital literacy and uh, an inequality sensitive approach when dealing with uh, these, these aspects. We think this was a great opportunity again to start building uh, a common space for discussion again on, on relevant uh, aspects for this uh, process and we hope to use this uh, to develop a Latin American contribution to the Global Digital Compact processes with, together with the APC and other program committee members. Thank you, Jamila. Definitely the IGF has been the confirmation that the, it can be a platform for channeling and uh, enabling and facilitating um, 
uh, com not only conversation and a policy dialogue, but also contributions and in, in, in the perspective of aligning with these other processes that are relevant for the regions. Uh, next, we will hear from Antoine. Uh, um, from Mission Public about the initiatives uh, that they have been conducting um, in contribution to the Global Digital Compact. So, Antoine, let's hear from you, please. Yes, hello, thank you. Um, so, we, we, we will be two voices, um, I will, Antoine and Yao, um, and I will introduce, then I will give the floor to Yao to um, present one of the pilots of the pilot we have done um, on the citizens engagement and then I will um, also shortly um, talk about another experience engaging um, non uh, usual suspects into internet governance so but first one principle is um, so one of the speaker was saying how do we go and listen um, to others and that's what we try um, to focus on at mission public uh, with our partners worldwide is to go and look for people that never um, talked about internet, never talked about internet governance, um, and even uh, don't have internet. Uh, the goal is to engage non-expert, um, ordinary citizens through what we call a deliberative process. So the goal is to randomly select a group of citizens which are representative of the diversity of their country or region, and to give them the keys to have the good questions to so the questions that stakeholders are asking themselves, but also the basic informations, contradictory informations on a topic in order to be able to discuss those uh, topics. We have been doing this kind of processes at local, national and uh, global level since uh, 20 years at Mission Public. And since 2017, we have been working on the future of the Internet with that basic idea of involving the people with, who have to bear the consequences of the policies. Um, in 2020, we had a global citizens' dialogues on um, the future of data, the future of uh, information, disinformation, artificial intelligence, and internet governance. Um, and many of the results were around internet governance and the future of internet governance. Um, so the work that has been done after on the roadmap was also very in line with the results of that uh, dialogue and we would like to go on working with citizens on their recommendation for the global digital compact and that's our work we've been um, having the chance to have one pilot in burkina faso and i will give the uh, microphone to yao uh, who is going to explain us a bit more on that pilot yao the floor is yours Thank you, host. Could it be possible to please unmute Sosu Yao? Thank you. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, thank you very much, Simon. Thank you very much for this opportunity that I've been given to us to talk about the digital global, uh, global digital compact. And until I've already mentioned the idea that we are to bring the ordinary citizens' voice into the governance of internet. And this is, has been a, a core foundation of the idea of the internet initiative. And we are I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Yao. Uh, not, coming, not coming through clearly. We cannot hear. And the transcripts are not uh, mm -hmm. uh, being able to capture what you are saying. So if you can just check if there is any problem with your mic, please. and. Share again what you wanted no, to. It's the same. No, it's the it's same. Okay. No. Not well. Try now. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me? Antoine, you, yes, we can hear you. Maybe you can share Antoine. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Antoine. Okay, so I was I was just saying that I, I thank you Antoine for the floor that I've been giving to me to talk about the experience of Burkina Faso being part of the read the internet first and also the opportunity we had to introduce the compact to the citizens of Burkina Faso. And just to a bit of a story, this uh, global compact dialogue was 
introduced in the context of the COVID-19, of course, and also a, a bit of kind of instability in the in the country. But we we are able to manage and handle the global digital compact dialogue during the this session. Basically, the session were actually about talking uh, about the with the internet, which is as Antoine expresses, how we give the floor to citizens to engage in the dialogue about the internet governance, the internet, the dialogue that you know as internet has become uh, our common. Sorry, okay, internet has now become our common goods. Everybody is using the internet, but. We have noticed that the citizens are actually not being given the chance to express themselves, especially youth. They are not being given chance to express themselves in the country, given the, the they are going through with the use of internet. So the opportunity was given to introduce the the global citizen, the global digital compact dialogue into the citizen dialogue on the future of internet in Burkina Faso, and among other. Uh, the discussion, they were given the choice to the participant to choose about the pri six priorities aligned to the Global Digital Compact. And through the discussions uh, of uh, digital competition, citizens come to conclusion about the top two priorities they think are really relevant to them when coming, talking about the Global Digital Compact. But before that, I would like to talk about a bit how the dialogue went, you know, in getting the season together to speak about the compact. If we can go to the next slide. So basically, the, we managed to have a, a 200 citizens participating in the hybrid format. A, more than 100 participants were online, also due to a connectivity issue. All of them could not stay until the end, but we managed to have their voice into the dialogue and discussion with other citizens on site. And as I mentioned, two priorities were, came out, out of the six priorities that were presented to the citizens. And all in all, they all agree upon priority one, which is connecting everybody, meaning everybody should have quality internet access. And the second priority, the thing is really relevant is data protection. You know, the data rule protection to ensure that everybody data is protected and regulated. Use uh, either use or transfer, even also disclosure of data uh, uh, data from each user. So this is because mainly in the country, the internet means having access to internet means also having access in, to information. It also facilitates communication with family, friends, and other stakeholders. And for them, protecting uh, data is important to, if, to avoid, you know, they know they are aware of hacking and also safeguard the privacy of the users. So among also what we, we could mention, the less important uh, priority all the participants agreed upon. It's the pri priority six, number six, I think, which were about uh, a, a intelligence artificial. They think the, that priority was is not really relevant to them. It's not really appealing to them because it's not in line with their their day day to day, you know, strug struggle they are facing. So they also try to come up with some guidelines to different stakeholders in line with the different uh, 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 priority. They, they say those are key priorities they, they wanted the, the government to be focused on. And the key element, they, the uh, suggestion they made for the public sector and the government regarding priority number one, which is uh, connecting uh, everybody, they wanted the government, the national authority to ensure that the entire region, the entire country is connected. When it comes to data protection, they want the government to pass a law that enforce citizen protect data protection online nationally, but also internationally. They also invited the private sector to in, engage 
in the dialogue and also to engage in in working to comply with the uh, data protection law in, online and also offline. They also engage the private sector to work, work closely with the government to reduce internet access costs. And they, one of the also recommendations to the civil society is to work in working, it's to work in raising awareness about the use of the internet and also raising awareness in the scope of online data protection. The, the participants also make, made some recommendation to international stakeholders helping the country in, in, in terms of the internet and internet governance. They mentioned that each country must connect to its entire territory. Developed country, developed country must bring their expertise to developing country in the field of technology. And each government must also, of course, ensure that the data store on the server are well protected by laws. And they really stress that. And in the international private se sector, to them, they request that they work in compliance with the regulation at the national level when it comes to data data protection. So those are a few, uh, I would say, commitment and uh, recommendation the citizens were able to make in regard to global digital comp compact uh, in February this, this year. And some lesson we learn. Next slide, please. Lesson I will, I will just try to also stress lesson learned so that we can more uh, make the next global digital compact discussion in the region and also in other countries more, you know, ready readiness in terms of readiness to discussions. Next slide, please. So some lessons we learn from this discussion discussion and global digital uh, compact discussion lesson learn what works and what did we learn so the, we can say that the hybrid format works and people were able to communicate and engage and we use a uh, set of uh, uh, different tools of maintaining communication with the uh, participant men including online forms and also online document that they can contribute together at the same time. So engagement from participants were really important and we really appreciate that the participants were really uh, engaging and they, they, all the topics uh, discussed were inter of high interest to them. And also uh, we had the exchange to have the representative of the ministry in charge of digital affairs. This is something we think for future event like that, it's, all, it's going to be really, really, really relevant to have representative from ministry of respected ministry in charge of the internet and internet governance to be part of the discussion. We didn't have chance to, in, uh, to have the, uh, I would say, Private sectors, because we is still invited them, but they could not make it to the event. But private se sectors were also invited, and the activity were also high interest for the media, and the facilitators also were highly informed. They took a, an informative role in the, the discussion in explaining, and uh, deepening the understanding of the global digital compact to the participant, so that get, they get more in insight on what they it expected from them and what they can give in terms of return. So, and also they were a concern about how, why not we could in, engage the high level discussion among uh, uh, citizens, citizens who are uh, digitally literate, I mean, those who really know about, uh, those who are really informed about the internet and internet uh, governance to have a set of maybe high level discussion among those citizens and to have a, a collect data from them uh, aside uh, alongside with uh, the general citizen discussion. So what we learn also is that the participants uh, want more contextualization of the uh, global digital compact 
the participant also want more word from high level person at the UN as we did during the uh, global citizen dialogue on the future of internet in 2020. They want Thank you, Yao. We need to, to move on. Oh, sorry. I hope yeah, I, we have three minutes left and I want to... Minutes left. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Sorry. But I wanted to, no, to maybe, wrap up. It, that's a good wrap up on the experience. I wanted to add a very uh, short thing. Can we see the next slide? Uh, because that is the kind of process that we have piloted. And there is another one that we had the chance to work on uh, at Mission Public. It was the Conference on the Future of Europe. It was launched by the Parliament, the European Parliament, the European Commission and the Council, so the member states in Europe. And they engage 800 citizens randomly selected from all the member states of the EU into a discussion on the digital future. Uh, one of those panels, uh, citizens' panels, was on stronger economy and digital transformation. And the citizens had the occasion to give 40 recommendations to the European Commission, the uh, European Parliament, and the Council on the future of digital matters in Europe. And of course, many of those topics were around topics that are also covered by the digital compact. So this is more about the process and to um, share with you that it is possible for very international organization, uh, for a pan-continental organization to roll out citizens' engagement with ordinary citizens and that they can have an impact. I just wanted um, to share that experience because it's a very um, good uh, way of showing how citizens' engagement can have impact. And um, actually, this Friday, the European Commission, the European Parliament and the Council will come back to the citizens and will deliver and present what they have done with the recommendations of the citizens. So I can only wish that we could have the same thing and the same process with the Global Digital Compact, and we are going to work on it. I give you the floor back in the room. Thank you very much, um, you and Antoine. Uh, let me just briefly give a couple of minutes to the to the room in the case that there are uh, other initiatives that uh, uh, you are engaged with and would like to share. If uh, have you engaged any of you with the global digital compact discussion and how so? Is there any? Uh, update from you or also if there is any specific recommendation on how to continue and sustain the input from civil society from now on your ideas are also very welcome so let me just give you the floor in the case that you have some suggestions Uh, sorry, uh, if, if any of you are interested in going to the Friendship Park, there are some shuttles that's going uh, that's going to start uh, collecting people at 6.30. So you. if you're interested, yeah. Okay, sorry. Thank you. We will make sure that we are done by then. <laughs> Thank you. So it's, uh, it's up to you. Uh, uh, if you want to share anything or um, share suggestions in relation to what to do next, uh, to sustain the, the civil society input into the process, your ideas are welcome. Otherwise, as I said, otherwise, let me just thank you and then, then check. Let's just check if there is anything from remote participants. Sorry, I had my finish. hand up. Okay, go ahead. My hand was up. I cannot. I'm not uh, okay. looking at. So, go ahead. I just wanted to share that um, GIZ. Uh, in collaboration with the Office of the Tech Envoy, is um, organizing regional consultations. Three of them, actually. One in Africa, in Nairobi, Kenya next week. Another one in Latin America, and I think another one in Asia. So uh, I don't know if you are aware of it. I know that this is um, an international cooperation driven event, but I think that we should be aware of it and Keep in contact with either GIZ or with the Office of the Taking Voice. Um, one other thing I would like to lay at the table, before I don't know if Yuping is still there, is regular communications on the website so that we know what is happening, where it is happening. 
I know that Rwanda and Sweden will do their part, but I think that ultimately they are, they are accountable to the office of the President of the General Assembly and not to civil society. And so we are hoping that the Secretariat will do their part and keep us um, updated through the website. Thank you. Thank you, Nina. Thank you very much. I'm Judith Arena, as external senior advisor for the UN Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression and Opinion. And as we know, um, we want to thank APC as always for the support for civil society engagement. The Special Rapporteur values extremely any views, ideas, and thoughts that civil society may have. And we would also commit to both receiving any inputs and suggestions that civil society representatives may have, either as a collective, as individuals, or from individual organizations. And as we prepare independent experts' input into the existing and open consultation, we would be very happy to take those views into account, but also, as always, to maintain an open dialogue with civil society to hear your perspectives. Thank you so much. It's very important also in terms of alignment and making the most of the possibility to contribute to the different processes and because they talk one to each other, definitely. So thank you so much for attending the session and for your contributions. And um, I hope uh, we see you in future engagements uh, that uh, the organizations might organize in relation to the um, to the compact. Definitely there are some plans in, uh, Jennifer, you want to, yeah, Ka Carol. Do you mind just if we do have a few? I know people have a lovely maybe. But uh, just to know, for people who are interested in what are cross-cutting issues, um, there's a lot of work that's been happening on gender. And so UN Women have been working with Yuping, with um, Amandeep, on how do we actually, uh, the UN Tech Envoy's office, on um, among the cross-cutting issues, of which there are many, uh, one of them is gender. And so you saw that one of the components is human rights. Um, so we can we can intervene just on this, but also if we look at this cross-cutting, um, because uh, what we're seeing is happening is a lot of issues are getting siloed, and uh, the perspective that we have from the Web Foundation is we're seeing the increasing hostility on the internet, on the web, that is uh, losing women's voices, women's political leadership. So it's actually um, the way that the web and the way that the internet are governed are uh, are affecting our um, our our democracies our sovereignty, um, and so these are really these critical issues, freedom of expression, freedom of information. So uh, the Global Digital Compact Open Consultations are closing at the end of March. Earlier in March is the Commission on the Status of Women. UN Tech Envoy and UN Women are working closely together on that. There's a, a movement of um, many different uh, civil society organizations that are delivering on that as well. APC, Derechos de Digitales is one of them. Access Now, Web Foundation, uh, Women's Rights Online Network, many of us. So I uh, would really welcome, if that is something that you are keen on, there's sort of a four-month deliverable um, on front and would welcome your, uh, your collaboration. Thank you. Thank you so much for the reminder of uh, the possibility to also contribute to the cross-cutting issues and the possibilities for collaboration. Uh, so watch for those opportunities and hope uh, we see you uh, around those efforts to keep uh, the civil society voice active and vocal around the global digital process. So thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Bye.